We are into week five of this message series called Family Meeting, week number five. And as most of you probably recall, uh, we are doing this as a way to look at how we can personally, individually become better members of the Lord's church. And Yes, better members of Liberty Christian Church, you know, better uh, as far as our involvement in this local congregation, but, but ultimately we're not, we're not all hung up on uh, your uh, membership of this church. There's no, uh, we, we can't initiate you into this church separate from the Lord's Church. You are part of the Lord's Church, and you're working here at Liberty, so of course uh, we all benefit from being better members of the church here at Liberty, but we are ultimately part of the Lord's church. That's what matters. And no matter where we are, everything we've been talking about matters. Okay? Nothing that we're talking about is something that personally we're just like, well, this is how Liberty Christian Church does it. You know, no, no, this is how the Lord's church does business. And so we've been talking about uh, what members of the Lord's church should be. Uh, and we don't have time to, to go through necessarily all of it. Um, but we're going through in these family meetings, these family meeting styles, just having open discussions. Uh, in some ways, the sermons are typical with the, you know, three, four, five point outlines. But in, in many ways, they're different in, in that they, they feel rather topical at, at times rather than uh, going through maybe verse by verse in some cases. But, but it's a family meeting style on purpose so that we can say this is important. And we need to step up to the plate, each one of us individually, personally, and become better members of the Lord's church in this way. And so we have to ask and answer that question. How can I become a better member of the Lord's church? How can I pull my weight? How can I be what I'm supposed to be so that not only I am to others what I need to be, but so that others around me become to me what I need them to be? Because I have weaknesses where their strengths come in and help. And, and I have strengths where their weaknesses need my help. And so uh, that's what we're doing here through all these. Uh, but ultimately, an even bigger goal is that we want to reach others for Christ. We don't, we're not looking at this all from an internal perspective, of course. There are lots of internal benefits. And by all means, we better be treating each other well, you know, especially those in the household of God, as the scriptures say. Uh, but we want to look outward with this. And we want to see, and we looked at that in the first message. Uh, we we kind of touched on it in the second and even last week as well in the fourth. That, that our world, our, our nation, and our own little community needs the church to be healthy needs the church to be taking care of one another and, and operating at its full potential, but also sharing the gospel, proclaiming that good news. The, the world needs us to be healthy because an unhealthy church, and we've got a lot of unhealthy churches in our, our country and really probably across the world, but, but we kind of have our finger on the pulse of what's going on in the United States, of course. But the world and our nation and our communities need us to be healthy, need a, a healthy church, and if we're going to reach the church or reach the community with the message that the church has to share, if we're going to reach our community, our country, and our nation with the gospel, with that good news, and change those communities, we're going to need to change our church. And if we change our church so that it's more healthy, so that it's operating more in line with the way the Bible prescribes for our, our behaviors and how we operate, how we do business, if we're going to change the church, that means each one of us individually has to get on board. Each, each soul in this room has to decide, I'm going to do this. Not, huh, I wonder if they'll all do this or not. No, the question is, will you do it or not? And if you take care of you right now and do what we're talking about doing, then everybody gets taken care of and we start to develop this attitude that others can't deny it. We see it in the scriptures all the time. We're supposed to be this light. Others are supposed to look at our love for one another even. Our love for one another inside the church and see and know that we are his disciples, right? I, I mean, this goes a long way just doing the things that we're talking about in these, these family meetings. And so, in this fifth family meeting this morning, I want to talk about an area where the church can improve through some education and perhaps some inspiration. Uh, today's area of improvement is one that literally every single one of us can participate in, is qualified to do so, and guess what? Is commanded to do it. <laughs> we can all do it. We're all supposed to do it. We've all been commanded to do it. We're all qualified to do it. So what do you say? Let, let's, let's do it. Let's talk about it first of all, okay? It's a very, very uh, easily attainable goal as well. Um, and this easily attainable goal 
will help everyone. All right, so it's something we can all do. It's something we've been commanded to do, qualified to do, and it will benefit everybody if we do it. So why don't we do it? Well, let's talk about it. This morning I want to bring you a message called Pray For Me. It's called Pray For Me. As members of the Lord's church, we are commanded to pray for one another. In, inside the church, we pray for other people, but we are commanded, absolutely, to be praying for each other. We need to be praying for one another. Uh, you can pray for yourself, and you, you should. There are times that you should do that. And others can, yeah, they can pray for themselves. I, yeah, it works like that as well, but we're supposed to be praying for one another as well. It's critical that we pray for each other. It's interesting to think about how the, the church is unique in this way. I need you to pray for me. You need me to pray for you. We need each other to be praying for one another. The, you depend on it. Whether you realize it or not, maybe you're missing out on it. Because number one, you don't realize it, and number two, maybe others aren't praying for you. I hope that's not the case, but let's be honest. Let's be real. Let's be adults here. Maybe other people aren't praying for you like they should. That's why we're going to talk about this in a family meeting right now, because we all depend on each other to be praying for one another. Yes, I can pray for myself, and you can pray for yourself, but we need prayers from our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need that to happen. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, and be ready there if you're not already. Uh, I know it's in the bulletin, so uh, the, all the, the tension that ever tries to get built at the beginning of sermons is just thrown away because y'all are just sitting there. You already know what I'm going to talk about. Unless I make the sermon title really weird because then you're like, maybe curious about where we're going. But I've been told not to do that. Not by you guys, but, but all, the, all the preaching books say don't do that. They say don't do that, the goofy sermon titles. I don't know. I like to throw it in every once in a while. But today, you, you can't hardly miss it, right? Pray for me. Um, this, this prayer thing is so important because it improves our, our spiritual strength. It improves our lives as a whole. And you can change someone's eternity through praying for strength for them to, to stay the course, to stay faithful. So, so listen up, okay? We're going to be reading those two verses, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, in just a second. But before we remind ourselves of what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus in those two verses, we need to remind ourselves of the context. And, and I'm not just saying that because I feel you know, unnatural jumping into the text without talking about the context. It's actually going to lay the, the groundwork, and it's actually where we're going to end, okay? My main text is not where we're starting or where we're ending, okay? That's probably breaking a preaching rule as well. But listen up, okay, because we need to know the context here. A lot of us are familiar with the armor of God, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, you could quote every piece and what it means, you know, what it is and all that stuff, but we've heard of the armor of God, right? In Ephesians chapter 6, that's where we read about the armor of God. It's in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, where Paul writes, put on the full armor of God, okay? So there it is. There's the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, Okay, so let's, let's do a quick pop quiz. Everybody cool with that? Okay, awesome. I, I appreciate, man, you guys, are, you guys are mature. Pop quiz, and you guys are like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I didn't expect that. So what's the command here in verse 11? What are we being told to do? Put on the full armor of God. Yep, so far so good, all right? I should have brought gold stickers. Oh, shoot. All right, and what does verse 11 say about why we should do this? I think you're saying the right thing. <laughs> That's just a lot of words for a whole crowd to say, okay? Yeah, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Last question, just one more. What then do we know that the devil does? Schemes, schemes right? It, it says, put on the full armor of God. There's a command. Why? So that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And then what do we learn about the devil's activity from that? He's a schemer. He's scheming. He's trying to trick. He's trying to, to, to tempt through trickery, through scheming, right? He doesn't just say, you know, we've all heard it. He doesn't have the red suit and the horns and the pitchfork and say, do this evil with me, you know. Like, he doesn't do that. He schemes. He packages it in a way that doesn't feel evil, doesn't feel that wrong, or, or maybe it feels like it's something that will feel good to me, and maybe it's not right to do, but it will feel good to me, and others likely won't find out. 
right? He schemes, we, we know that. First Timothy chapter three, verse seven, um, mentions falling into the snare of the devil. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 26, mentions escaping the snare of the devil. First Peter chapter five, verse eight says the devil is our adversary, right? And it says that we need to be alert because of his work, what he's doing. And it says, we all know this, that he's prowling around, he's seeking somebody to devour. This guy's intense. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 tells us that Satan disguises himself. That's tricky. First John chapter five verse 19 mentions the extremely popular and highly effective, right, the whole world follows, the power of the evil one. Second Corinthians chapter two verse 11 talks of not being taken advantage of by Satan. How? By not being ignorant of his schemes. 1 John 3, 8 mentions the works of the devil. James chapter 4, verse 7 says that we've got to resist the devil. So he's obviously offering us something. He's, he's putting something out there. We need to resist what he's offering us. And it goes on to say that he, if you do that, he will flee from you. So he's clearly hanging around us. He's in our business, right? Revelation 12, verse 9 says that Satan deceives the whole world. That's tricky as well. That's scheming. And Matthew 4, 3 just outright calls Satan the tempter. Gives him that title. He's the tempter. With all that in mind, I'm going to say what I hope we're all thinking. Pray for me. This is the foundation of this message. This is not just a, you know, Christians are supposed to pray at the end of the service. We're all going to hold it. This is not that. This is you're under attack. This is we're under attack. This is, oh, the reason you're not doing what you should do, the reason that I'm forgetting to pray for you, and the reason that you're not praying for me is because the devil's up to something. The devil is fighting against us. He's scheming. He's laying, he's putting snares out, traps, intentionally placing them so that we will get caught in them and just, it just destroy our lives. Pray for me. And you should be saying the same thing to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at the situation we're in. Pray for me. We need to pray for each other. So now let's look at our text. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. Look, guys, this is right in line with put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And it says you've got this to put on and this to put on and this. And this is because of that and this is because of that. And then when we come to those words in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, it says, and, it says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for, look, it says all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. There are three quick, simple lessons that Paul, uh, his words bring to mind here that can help us become better church members when it comes to, to being alert in prayer. And the first important lesson that we see here is that we should pray with alertness. To pray with alertness. It, it, it takes a very alert mind, an alert attitude, if you will, an alert mindset to do what Paul is instructing us to do in verse 18 of the text. Paul says pray all the time. He says pray at all times. Pray at all times. What about when you don't feel like it? What about when you're not, you know, you're just not in the mood? You know, somebody else do it. I'm not in the mood. What about when you're uncertain about what's going to happen, uncertain about what should happen, uncertain about what to pray for? Should you pray then? When you're upset with somebody? When you're angry? Or what about when things are actually going pretty smoothly? <laughs> Why pray, right? What about when things are falling apart? What's it say? Pray at all times, right? Pray all the, the time. We're supposed to be praying at all times. But more specifically, Paul says to pray at all times in the Spirit. Right? That, that's what we really need to see. It says pray at all times in the Spirit. So that means we need to be praying in the Spirit, uh, in, in His will. Right? Pray that the Lord's will be done. Pray for what you wisely, because you've studied the scriptures and you know what would be good for the kingdom of God, pray for what you know is within the will of God. Pray, pray for what you wisely know would be honoring God. Pray with a, a kingdom focus. Pray seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Pray like that. Pray at all times 
in the spirit, Paul says. And Paul says, be on the alert. So that means if we're alert, that, that, that's not just, um, like we can't just put our finger on one particular thing uh, that that means. Like as far as, um, I, I said that in a really sketchy way, didn't I? <laughs> There's a lot to that, I guess is what I mean. There's a lot to that, more than just, you know, oh, be alert. Oh, yep, I'm awake, I'm awake. I got good sleep last night, got a cup of coffee in my hand, I'm ready to pray. It's not just be alert. There are certain things that, that, that come behind this. Be aware of needs, of course. Be aware, of course, that we are all in need. That's kind of general, but also be aware of specific needs. Now, here's where this starts to blow up a little bit, where this starts to get a little bigger, a little more robust, is that means that we're actually gonna have to pause in our lives. We're going to have to actually take some time and we're going to have to think about what does he need? What does she need? What does he need? What's he need? You know, what, what, what do my brothers and sisters need? What are their prayer needs? What are they struggling with? Maybe even, I'll bet there's something underneath of it all that I don't even know about and I'm going I'm to pray about that. I don't know what it is, but God does. Like, like we, gotta, we, can't just, we can't just grab a bulletin, and I don't know that many of us necessarily do that, but we can't just grab a bulletin and go, these are all the people that need prayer in my life right now. There's seven of them. <laughs> you think there's seven people who need prayer right now? <laughs> no, we all do. But if you're going to be alert, if you're going to pray in the Spirit and be alert, you're going to have to actually stop and think about, you, be alert. What do people need me to pray about? How can I be praying for them? And how can I get involved in those situations to help out? Now we also see in verse 18 that alertness calls for perseverance. Right? It, uh, alertness is, again, it's bigger than just, you know, being like, I'm awake, my eyes are open. <laughs> There's more to it than that. Alertness requires perseverance. It calls for perseverance. Don't expect immediate answers. All right? And it's not that, I'm not saying you're not going to get them sometimes. I'm not saying that there won't be times where you're like, Wow. I prayed, and by the end of the week, right, because that feels immediate, you know, this week it, it, it happened. They got better, or, or they seemed more encouraged. They, they seemed like, like they um, really got it, you know, that thing they were struggling with, they, they got it figured out. It's all good. You know, I'm not saying that that won't ever happen, that you won't ever get immediate answers, but don't pray expecting immediate answers, because what will happen if you pray expecting immediate answers? When you don't get them, what will you do? Give up, right? So don't pray expecting immediate answers. Pray with alertness, which calls for perseverance. Be alert and persevere in your prayers. Don't give up. Remember Jesus' parable where, that he told in Luke chapter 18 about being um, uh, persistent in prayer? Remember that where he gave that example? Luke 18 actually begins. Verse 1 actually says, now he, talking about Jesus, says now he was telling them a parable to show. Okay, tells you the reason why he's telling this parable. Right, not all parables do that. Some parables you have to be like, well, this is what it means or that's what it means. I mean, we can figure them all out. But this one just flat out says, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray. That sounds like what we've already read in Ephesians. He was telling them this parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart, it says. That's what Luke chapter 18, verse 1, that's how, that, that's how Luke 18 starts. Now Jesus goes on to tell the parable, and it's about this widow who kept coming to this unrighteous king, right? He didn't respect, uh, he didn't fear God, he didn't respect men, right? He didn't care about God's opinion, he didn't care about man's opinion, right? So this guy basically just looked out for himself, and that's all he cared about. That's important to the story. This lady's asking for uh, protection from her opponent, it says, you know, something this guy couldn't care less about, right? And it, the Bible says, for a while he didn't. He didn't, he couldn't have cared less. He, he was um, not giving in. He wasn't really listening, wasn't really paying attention. But she didn't give up. She kept coming back, kept calling on him. And eventually, because of her persistence, even this wicked, uh, you know, heathen king of a guy gave in and gave her this good thing that she needed. And then Jesus says in verse 7, Luke chapter 18, verse 7, he says, now will not God, okay, not a heathen king, but will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night. It doesn't say who lash out and cry, God help me. Maybe he will. But it says, won't he 
Won't he deliver those who cry out day and night? Who follow the example, this teaching that I'm giving in this parable? Won't he answer that prayer? The son of the living God himself said, don't stop. He says, keep asking and keep asking day and night. Cry out to God. Church, our alertness in prayer requires persistent prayer. But we also learn, second thing here, we learn from the end of verse 18 of our text in Ephesians chapter 6, we need to pray for all the saints. Don't pick and choose and be like, these are the people I like to pray for. Or, you know, this is my niche. What they're going through right now, that's, that's why I like to pray for. Pray for all the saints, okay? At the end of verse 18, when Paul said, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition, he said, for all the saints. He said, for all the saints. Now, who are the saints? Well, we started this series with a discussion from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, right? And that verse had Paul saying this to the church. He said, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Now, there are other texts that we could point to to answer this question, but uh, I use this one because this is the one we just talked about a few weeks ago or four weeks ago, whatever it's been at this point. And look how clear it is in this one verse alone that's just the opening to a letter. It's just the beginning of a greeting to a letter. He says, to the church, to the church of God, saints by calling. Okay, we talked about what that means. With all who in every place Call on our Lord Jesus Christ. Call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's them in Corinth and it's everyone else who has become a Christian by the authority of Christ. Answering that call to obey the gospel. Those are all the saints. The church. All Christians are saints. The church is a group of saints. Holy, sanctified, set apart for God. Believers and followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says. So Paul says to pray for all the saints. So that means we need to Pray for young people, okay? Now, if we're going to pray for young people, that means that we need to take time to consider the specific needs that young people have. What's the best way that I can be praying in the Spirit for younger Christians? High school age, college age, young adults. We also need to pray for older people. This means we need to take time to consider the kinds of prayers, the kinds of needs that, that older people are going to have. How can I be praying for those who have recently retired? or for those who are continuing to work, or those who have a critical caregiving role in their grandchildren's lives, or for those who are facing health concerns, or those who are struggling to feel valuable in, in daily life, in their uh, family role, or, or even in the church, finding their place as things have changed with their, just simply their age. We need to pray for those who are somewhere in the middle, those who are raising families, still kind of working on that. That means we need to take the time to consider the kind of needs that these families have. How can I be praying for, for parents with young children? How can I be praying for uh, parents who have uh, older teen children? How can I really be praying for those who have both, right? I mean, come on, amen? Okay, thanks a lot. You know, how can I be praying for these People. How can I be praying for those, those people who are in that group, who are working with this list of priorities that involves working to provide for their families, raising their children very intentionally in the Lord, trying their absolute best to do that, uh, trying to take care of their own bodies and minds, and keeping all that they do in line with a, a kingdom focus? How can I be praying for those people? We need to pray for women. This means we need to take time to consider the specific, the specific needs that women have. How can I pray for younger women, older women, married women, single women, widows? We've got them all in, in our small little church, right? How can I pray for their example, the older women to the younger women and, and so on? How can I pray for their very uh, special, unique, God-given roles? How can I be praying for them? And we need to pray for men. This means we need to take time to consider the kinds of prayer needs that, that men are going to have. Right? How can I pray for young men, older men, young men who are in high school or college, young men who are working but aren't married yet and they haven't started leading a family yet? How can I pray for older men who, uh, whose physical struggles maybe are creating some mental struggles, lacking that confidence that they once had and, and those leadership abilities that they used to be able to execute you know, with confidence? How can I pray for men who don't feel like men? And by that, I mean who don't feel like the alpha male but also know that God has created them to lead and to show some strength and confidence? You know, please, church, pray for all the saints. 
We all have different needs, right? Paul instructs it here in verse 18. All the saints, all Christians, all the church, uh, we're all fighting against those schemes of the devil, right? He's slotting in there. He's laying those snares that he knows that are, are, might work on you, that he knows have a good chance of working on you. He's trying to trick us, and we need to be praying that we'll be aware of those tricks, that we'll see those schemes, we'll notice those snares, and we'll avoid them every day that, that be, from our own prayers through the, the work of the Holy Spirit and through your prayers for us, one another, that we'll be able to escape the devil's trap. And then, last thing I want to talk about, in, in most cases, the devil's working the hardest against a particular group. He's being the most patient as he works on this group. He's working the most heinous schemes, planning the most painful experiences, and trying to inflict the most widespread damage he possibly can against a particular group within the church. And so the last lesson that Paul brings to mind here is that we need to pray especially for church leaders. We need to pray especially for church leaders. It's Monday morning, and many things are on his mind, but his sermon is at the top. He starts by praying hard for understanding and wisdom and direction and application and effectiveness. He then hits the sermon study hard. He reads and he reads and he reads the text. He begins to formulate an understanding of the text in its context and an understanding of how this text could benefit the congregation. He combs commentaries, articles, outlines, maps, and other study aids. A possible outline for a sermon uh, starts to come together just a little bit, but it's lunchtime now, and three phone calls came in during various parts of the morning. He's learned that he needs to let those go so that he can return them later, or he'll, he'll never have that uninterrupted study time that he desperately needs. But the stress of those phone calls weighs heavily on him. He knows that one of those calls will add multiple responsibilities to his already busy week ahead. One of them leaves only a, a vague message so that he has no idea what he may be walking into. And the third is not from his congregation, but it's someone who wants to know if he can meet sometime this afternoon or evening to talk. And so the rest of his afternoon is spent on those phone calls. 45 minutes, 2 hours and 10 minutes, 1 hour and 27 minutes. And he agrees to meet with that third caller later that evening after he has supper with his wife and kids because every single evening of the rest of that week is booked with church meetings, family functions, and other previously scheduled commitments. That's Monday. That's without any, uh, anything that you might call bad happening. Sometimes the rest of the week intensifies as emergencies pop up, unexpected family drama, church member issues, special requests and opportunities, counseling needs, and so much more. Other times the week doesn't dramatically intensify, but it's filled with additional time dedicated to accomplishing all those tasks that the events of Monday and or Tuesday dumped into that week's demands. And so long-term planning and preparation become difficult challenges to work into the weekly routine. Calling on wayward church members and lost prospects doesn't happen in the way that he originally planned. Tracking church trends, determining what's truly going on, requires more time than he has. And spending as much focused, intentional time with his family as, as he hopes to, to spend, it starts to feel like a goal that's drifting further and further and further away from reality. In verse 19 of our text, Paul said, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. This should remind us of how important it is to pray for God's messengers. God's messengers who many times are uh, part of the leadership of a particular congregation with, with so many value, uh, valuable responsibilities, valuable to the church, valuable to the whole congregation. Hebrews 13, 7 says to remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Church leaders play this valuable role in their congregations, and we need men who will lead. We need men to be able to lead well, and we need to pray for them so that they can lead well. To make that possible, we've got to be praying. So pray for preachers. Pray for me. Uh, I, this is, all of a sudden, I'm getting real personal, right? And I can't help it. You guys, if this is something you need to do, even if I'm the, 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 the object of what I'm preaching and it feels awkward, I, I got to preach it. I got I to gotta teach it. I got to tell y'all. So pray for me. Pray for my sermons. 
Pray that God will give me wisdom and insight and understanding and words to be able to preach. It's an incredible task to preach uh, every single week, week in and week out, uh, again and again. And you all may be hearing me as the preacher, but, but pray that, and it is critical that ultimately you're hearing the words of God. That you're not hearing me and how Jake interprets something but that Jake has, through your prayers, interpreted things correctly and is sharing the Word of God with you. That's critical. And so you need to pray for me, not, not in some, some, you know, not fulfilling some selfish desire that I have, but for your own good, pray for my sermons. Pray for my teaching. That it be God's Word packaged in a way that earns your attention and convicts you in the way that you need it to. All right? But also pray for those who are involved in advising me and counseling me. We've got a number of men <clears throat> who help with all that. And they have a lot on their plate. They play a major role in leading this congregation also. I rely heavily on their, their counsel when I'm making decisions that are for the best uh, of this congregation. As the evangelist, as I'm making those decisions, I, re I rely on what they have to say. Uh, two heads are better than one. Uh, six or seven are even better. Pray for their wisdom and their insight and their decision-making abilities. Pray for them to keep the congregation on the tops of their minds, to step up to the plate and to be accountable for their actions. And pray for church leaders and their families as well. Don't forget the families. One of the qualifications for elders is that they lead their families well. That's important. The Bible begs the question in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, but if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Right? Church leaders definitely need prayer over this. I know many church leaders along with myself are concerned about uh, our ministry and our family, uh, which is really kind of one thing, but there are definitely uh, multiple balls kind of in the air as you, as you actually work that out in real life. And I know that many of them are concerned, many church leaders, including myself, are concerned about neglecting their families because of the demands of ministry. There's so much responsibility that we have to both, to our families and to ministry. And so pray for church leaders and their families. And then pray for protection. This is the last thing I'll say. Pray for protection for church leaders. And when I say that, I mean, we talked about what the devil's trying to do. What do you think he's trying to do, church leaders? With such great responsibility comes great challenges and risks. And quite frankly, dangers. It's dangerous. I can only assume that it would be difficult to lead a, a congregation uh, without active opposition. But I can only assume, because I've never experienced it, no one has ever experienced being part of church leadership without active opposition. Because the devil is always actively opposing the church, the individual Christians who make up the church, right? Including church Leadership. The devil works hard against church leaders. Very hard. Church leaders are expected to, to live at this high standard, above reproach, examples to the congregation, demonstrating faith that, that is worthy of being imitated, and more than that even. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, Paul writes, he's talking about elders, but he writes that an elder must have a good reputation with those outside the church, listen to this, so that he will not fall into reproach, and here comes again, the snare of the devil. So he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, like I said, in its context, this may be referring to elders, but rest assured, the devil is setting snares for church leaders of all kinds. Of all kinds. The devil is tempting church leaders. And the devil tempts us where he knows that we are weak. We have weaknesses, by the way. <laughs> Many of you are like, yeah, I see them, Jake. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sometimes it's obvious. I get it. I get it. But the devil knows where to set his snare to trap us and listen, in such a way that our reputation and our influence will be damaged and destroyed. Paul wrote to Timothy, we just read it, about falling into reproach and the snare of the devil. It's our reputation, that reproach, right? That's damaging a reputation. It's our reputation as being trustworthy that, that gives us the, the influence to be able to lead a congregation. And so... You don't think that, if you don't think the devil's going to attack that, then, then you haven't thought about this very long. 
That's what the devil's going to attack. You better believe that the devil is attacking church leaders. He's attacking me. He's attacking other church leaders as well. I see it now in my life like I've never seen it before. It's scary. It's difficult. Sometimes I feel so confident, you know, that, that I'm not going to fall in this trap because I've been around you guys. You've really encouraged me. I've, I've been in the word uh, like I should be. And then other times I can be around you and I can be in the word and I feel almost helpless. We need to pray for each other. We certainly need to be praying for church leaders. We need you guys to be praying for our, our protection. Pray for us to avoid temptation. To have the will to flee. Right? The Lord works in us to, to will to do the right thing. I need you to be praying for me and for other church leaders that they'll have the will to flee temptation and continue making wise decisions that are in the best uh, interest of the entire flock for the good of the entire church. And so as I wrap this up, can I just draw your attention back to where we started? Told you I'd do it. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. This verse that set the tone gave us the context for our main text. Verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So prayer with alertness, prayer for all the saints, and prayer especially for church leaders is something that every single church member must be doing. You need it. I need it. We all need it to, to be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The devil is scheming. Uh, again, please don't take this as just another sermon on prayer. Please instead take this as a plea, not only from your evangelist, but also on behalf of the entire congregation, a plea for help. Help because we're being attacked. Help because Satan is setting snares. He's creating traps. He's trying to embarrass us and discourage us and hurt us and paralyze us and disarm us, take away our power for good. And ultimately, he's trying to, right, destroy us, trying to devour us. So as the sermon title says, I'll close by just saying, pray for me.